So culture is kind of the uh, third rail of political science. People used to make these terrible cultural arguments back in the 60s where the idea was let's make uh, democratic values resonate across the world and we got accused of cultural imperialism for good reason. So I decided I wanted to try to find a way to look at culture that was more empirical and neutral and also that uh, anticipated a lot of the institutional and policy changes that were put into place in the 18th and 19th century. Mm -hmm. And I hit on this use of literature and computational text analysis as a way of doing that. So there are lots of different reasons why countries come up with different education systems at different points in time. And some of the reasons are familiar to us, class struggle and uh, the rise of democracy, which changes the need for mass education. But I also think there's a way in which cultural narratives about education matter. So how do we think that education contributes? Is it good for building a strong society? which is what happens in Denmark, or is it good for building really self-actualized individuals, which is how the Brits look at it. So in this way, culture and cultural ideas about education itself, about society, about the working class, about coordination versus conflict, all of those things matter deeply to the sorts of policy solutions that people come up with in these countries. So another thing that I found really fascinating about this project was to look at how the authors and other uh, poets and other intellectuals, of course, mattered to policy outcomes in these really early times of education development. If you go back to the 18th century, this is of course before we had democratic countries, there weren't a lot of ways to pass ideas up to rulers. And one of the few ways that existed were in these novels and political magazines where uh, writers would debate these issues in public fora and then they would try to impress upon rulers that their ideas mattered. And there was, uh, there's a lot of evidence that they had far more impact on policy making in this early period than we give them credit for. So again, I think that some countries form more solidaristic social policies than others because they focus more on broad societal needs than they do on individual uh, redistributive struggles. So if you look at Denmark, for example, education is about building a strong society. Workers are considered to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And in the late 18th century, when they were trying to improve Denmark's fortunes on the world stage, both in terms of being able to export uh, their goods to other countries as well as having political influence, these uh, rulers hit on this idea. These are, these are advisors to the uh, new king of Denmark, the new crown prince. Uh, they hit on the idea that you could form social policies, social investment policies such as education to support economic growth. So uh, these rulers were really interested in having better agricultural technologies and using better agricultural methods. They had to get farmers and agricultural workers to go along with these new ideas. And so they decided that they had to educate these people to be receptive of new educational technologies and new agricultural technologies. So they set out to have a mass education system. But it was really more about getting a strong society than it was about redistribution to poor people or trying to ha make sure that everybody got some individual needs met. It was more about like, this is a group effort and we have to do it. So authors are particularly good at framing messages. I mean, that's what they do. They create stories, they create narratives. And so within these political movements that they became involved in, 
and they became involved in these movements in a really intense way. I mean, they were, they were just right in there uh, struggling along with their comrades to try to get their views heard. But the authors in the movements were particularly good at creating these stories that made you think about education and the working class in a specific light and the role of the state. And in Denmark and Britain, they thought about it in such different ways along the lines of what I was just talking about. So workers are part of the solution in Denmark, they're part of the problem in Britain. Well, Hariri and Sale were really crucial to the whole project. So I started out by reading novels, and I was doing that at the BU Center for the Humanities. And I also started digging in the archives to look at how authors specifically got involved in these struggles. So there was a lot of who did what, when, where, and how. And I thought that was an important corrective because we haven't really looked at authors very much in these struggles. But I wanted to know if my impressionistic thoughts about authors framing persisted over long periods of time, persisted over centuries, for example. And so what I did is I went to the uh, sale group and I started talking to them about how I might use computational text analysis and computational linguistics to test these cultural icons that I was observing. And the first thing we did were uh, word frequency scripts so that I could, um, I could build these snippets of text around education words and then have these other concepts and define words for those other concepts and then test in the corpora, and I had several ones for Britain and Denmark, obviously, and it was great because they're in different languages, so it was easy to know which text belonged to which. Um, and so then I would build these corpora and I would observe uh, and compare and contrast British, uh, British representations of society, for example, in education words, and then Danish interpretations of society. And the outcomes were terrific because Denmark was much higher on things like society and workers but uh, much lower on things like individualism and markets, for example. And so they, there was a fair amount of variation. And one thing I just wanted to add is that I did, uh, I tracked give in English and Danish, which is basically the same word, and they tracked beautifully over this period. So those words are kind of the same. Uh, in the two corpora. So that was a way to, to make sure that I wasn't observing some kind of differences in language. I also just wanted to mention that I stem the text, which means take off the endings, and I took out stop words like and, the, etc., so that I would make sure that differences in the structure of the language wouldn't be part of what I was reporting in these differences. People do write about cultural frames a lot. Um, but I think being able to observe these long-term patterns is really important. And in fact, I have a whole part of the book that looks at culture in processes of institutional continuity and change. And what I say is that authors inherit these cultural frames from their literary ancestors. They rework these frames for contemporary problems and then they pass them down to literary descendants. So the, the frames are altered a little bit and you have changes in genre and you know in, in world events and socioeconomic factors. But what's super interesting is that even as things shift, these cultural frames help policy to be shifted in directions that are familiar in each country. And what I find um, what I find especially interesting is we have this idea about continuities in institutional change that have to do with policy legacies, is what we call them in political science. And that just means that the policy you create in year one is going to continue to have impacts in year 50. So I think this is an alternative mechanism to policy legacies. Because what happens is these cultural frames when you sit down every time to discuss something, it's not what we've done in the past that's important in this case. It's the way that you bring to bear a set of thoughts 
and ideas to so solving the problem. And so at every intervention, you get similar frames helping people to make new choices, even when the choices are moving in new directions. There have been enormous um, changes in the last 200 years. And uh, we're grappling with issues today that people didn't have to do grapple with 200 years ago. And also authors are less important today than they were 200 years ago because they're competing with all kinds of um, uh, talking heads and media influencers and talk radio hosts. And so they're not going to have the same kind of impact. But that said, when you look at how people are grappling with problems today, and in particular trying to maintain educational systems that will prepare workers for the knowledge economy and encourage economic growth, but at the same time make sure you have a measure of equality so that all people get some kind of education and a chance at education. There, these cultural values matter a lot. And so one of the things I do at the end of the book is I do a survey of 2,100 young people in Britain and Denmark. And of course the Danish survey is done in Danish. And I ask them to talk about um, their ideas of reforms. And also I have some experimental design questions where uh, I manipulate variables. And so if you introduce a cue that mentions building a strong society, support goes up in Denmark and it goes down in Britain. And if you design a cue about the state, it again goes up in Denmark and down in Britain. And so I think some of the same kinds of cultural frames that I observed uh, in the late 18th century are still relevant today. One of the nice things about globalization is that people are recognizing other kinds of solutions exist. And, uh, and sometimes that works in, uh, in helpful ways and sometimes it works in harmful ways. So for example, we, for the last 20 or 30 years in education, we've been very influenced by these neoliberal ideas of trying to get, uh, you know, teach to the test and make all schools live up to national standards that are going to make everybody um, get the same kind of education. The problem with that is not everybody is the same, has the same capacities for academic education. The Danes are really have always been into learning by doing mechanisms where you kind of teach a student uh, according to his or her needs and his or her learning style. And we don't do that very much in America because we are so influenced by the Anglo system. So I think that uh, Americans could learn from these, um, these other examples in the world, especially the Nordic examples, about how you could build more social solidarity uh, if you tried to design programs that were going to build up society. And you put it more in those terms of doing things that are going to be in our, all, all of our long-term best interests. And we really have to think about how we can make each person have accessible to them measures that are going to educate them in the best way possible. If I were going to wave my magic wand and design solutions for the world, I would give teachers more flexibility in educating according to the needs of the kids.